Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome your conference moderator, Charlotte Grove. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome back. How many of you had fun last night? Did something really fun? Anybody go ride the mechanical bull anywhere? I heard somebody did. I don't see them this morning. So either A, they still had so much fun, B, they're recovering, or B, they just, or C, they don't remember. But uh, I did hear that somebody went out and did that. I tried that in my youth, and um, what an exciting time. But we hope you did do something fun in, in Dallas last night um, and enjoyed that, and that you're back today ready for more information. In your um, program from yesterday, you will notice if you turn ahead a couple of pages that you will see the um, agenda for today, the list of speakers, et cetera. Several of you have asked if there were handouts for today. It is, again, in that program. There are on the registration tables outside a few handouts left of the copies that were made for the entire conference. So those are there. Again, a few administrative things. For those of you that have the cell phones, um, would you please turn them off or on to silent? We would greatly appreciate that. Again, today we do have our signers here, so they are um, providing for that. The announcement that was made almost at the close yesterday about the networking breakfast or networking time. Again, that was something that was we tried to assist those of you, some 80 of you that asked if there was any way. It was strictly voluntary. We did post um, all 10 regions with the states under those regions on that bulletin board last night. It was voluntary for anyone that wanted to show up. So if you came this morning and your region uh, was not here, I'm sorry for that. We had um, uh, facilitators. We had all 10 regions broken out. Some of you were able to network. How many of you were able to network within your regions this morning? Well, that's good. That's a good number. Now, from 12 to 12.45, in the Sapphire Room. We are making another effort for those of you that want to network within your regions. So again, that's from 12 to 12.45 in the Sapphire Room. Again, it's voluntary. If for any reason your particular region um, representative is not there, they're aware of it, we can only do so much to help facilitate that. It is an important process, so if we can do that, we'll try and do it. The breaks and lunches, again, same scenario as yesterday, same restaurants. Again, if you would keep the walkways uh, clear, and particularly today, you will see floor mics because we have four Q&A sessions, and I'll address each one of those as they happen. Our facilitators have been asked, again, if you can bring luggage in for those of you that are checking out today. Please do not. We do not have the storage space. It is not a secure site. So I would encourage you to use the uh, bell services, or if a colleague is staying over later uh, until tomorrow and you can put things in their room. But otherwise, I, I would not encourage you to bring it into the room. Again, if you are wireless, you should be able to access in this room. Uh, there, as I mentioned yesterday, there is no electrical power. So having said all of those announcements, it is now my pleasure to introduce our first presenters for today. Our first discussion is over RDS payment overview, and we have two presenters. James Mayhew, whom you'll remember from yesterday, and Joanne Salznock. Joanne, I will introduce. She is the uh, Retiree Drugs Subsidy IT Development Manager with the Government Services Group, VIPS, Inc. She has been a VIPS employee since May 1992. She has been in a management role since 1999. She is currently responsible for the development of the system requirements training, and overall system testing. She manages a team of 10. 
She has been involved in EDI, HEPA, and CF CFO projects, as well as call center support. She is an author and editor for the WEDNI SNP publication. Prior to coming to BIPS, Joanne worked her way from coder to a director role at a Dun & Bradstreet subsidiary, providing healthcare reporting products. She has more than 25 years of technical and project management experience, specialized in the healthcare sector. It is my pleasure to welcome Jim and Joanne. Good morning. I see most of you came back. That's a good sign uh, from, from yesterday. That tells me that we all had fun here yesterday. And we're going to continue to have fun. We're going to continue to, uh, to learn today. Um, yeah, what we're going to do this morning is go over the, the, uh, the payment process. Uh, what I will do is just go over briefly the statutory and regulatory requirement. And then Joanne will get into more detail. But just um, wanted to um, let you know that the payment process is not final. It's, it's still in the works. So what we're talking about today is really our current thinking about the, the payment process as we develop the system. And so we're, we're really going to be uh, looking forward to your input and your comments and your questions to help us develop this process as we move along. And then once we develop the process, um, it will go through, just like the application did, a Paperwork Reduction Act uh, clearance process where it will be, a, be uh, published in the, the, um, the data elements will be published in the Federal Register and there will be a 30-day comment period. So there will be, starting today, there will be plenty of opportunities for input and comment in this uh, system as we uh, continue to develop it. Okay, um, let me just give you a high-level overview of the requirements. When you talk about payments, I guess the first question that comes to mind is what, what, what is the amount that's going to be paid? And that's pretty clear in the statute. And essentially, it's for each qualifying covered retiree in the sponsor's retiree qualified retiree prescription drug plan, the sponsor will receive a subsidy of 28% of the allowable costs in the plan year that are attributable to the gross prescription drug cost between the cost threshold and the cost limit. That's, that's the rule for the, uh, for the payment, and I'll break that down in a second. But, um, you know, when I was at the lunch break yesterday, I was back in the CMS staff room uh, reading over the questions, and there were lots of questions about what is a qualifying covered retiree. So I thought I'd go over that briefly um, to hopefully uh, answer some of those questions and clarify exactly who you can get the subsidy for. And essentially, a qualifying covered retiree is a participant, uh, a spouse or dependent of a participant who is a Medicare-eligible individual who is either retired or disabled and is eligible to enroll in Part D, but does not enroll in Part D. And basically, it really boils down to the individual participant status. And the question to ask is, do they really have, does the participant have current employment status under the MSP rule? Essentially, are they actively working? If they're actively working, then even though they're Part D eligible, you cannot collect the subsidy for that person. And the other thing to remember is the, the, the eligibility for the spouse of the dependent really is tied to the status of the participant. I'll give you a couple of examples. For example, if you have a, a participant in your plan who is retired, Medicare eligible, eligible for Part D, does not enroll in Part D, uh, you can collect the subsidy for that participant. If that participant has a spouse who is on this, 
the employer, we'll call that employer, employer A, employer A's plan, but the spouse is Medicare eligible, um, but does not enroll in Part D, but the spouse is actively working for employer B, but is on employer A's retiree plan as the spouse of the participant. The employer A can collect the subsidy for that spouse, even though that spouse is actively working for another company. The key is that the spouse is enrolled in the participant's retiree plan and is Medicare eligible. Conversely, if you have employer A has a participant who is actively working, but Medicare eligible, not enrolled in Part D, but actively working in the active plan, the employer A cannot collect the subsidy for that participant. If that participant has a spouse who is also on the active plan, employer A's active plan, is retired, Medicare eligible, not enrolled in Part D, that em employer A will not be able to collect the subsidy for that, uh, for that spouse, even though that spouse is retired, because that spouse is tied in with the participant's active plan. So that's essentially an, a really um, basic overview of who a, what a qualified a covered, um, qualified covered retiree is. Now, um, as I said, the amount of the uh, retiree drug subsidy payment, again, is for each qualifying covered retiree. The sponsor receives a subsidy payment of 28% of the allowable cost that is attributable to the gross prescription drug cost between the cost threshold and the cost limit. So what are gross prescription drug costs? Essentially, gross prescription drug costs is a non-administrative cost incurred under the plan in the plan year for the purchase of Part D drugs. And essentially, this is going to be the dispensing fees. Uh, the, well, first of all, it's going to be the ingredient cost of the drugs plus the pharmacy dispensing fees. Again, uh, administrative costs cannot be counted towards the gross prescription drug cost. And the gross cost includes not only costs paid by the plan, but it also includes the cost paid by the, the retiree. So it does include the retiree's cost sharing. Okay, so that's the basic on the gross cost. What are the allowable retiree costs? Allowable retiree costs are, again, gross prescription drug costs that are actually paid. Um, they're paid by the plan, by the qualifying covered retiree, or on the qualifying covered retiree's behalf. Net of any manufacturer or pharmacy discounts, charge back, rebates, and other price concessions that are received by the insurance carrier or the plan sponsor. So essentially what you have to do when you want to calculate the subsidy amount for a particular qualifying covered retiree is you take the gross cost that's incurred by that retiree between the cost threshold and the cost limit for that particular plan year. Then you have to back out the rebate and the price concession that are associated with those gross costs and then you apply the 28%. And that will essentially get your um, subsidy amount. OK, in the final regulations, we outline the payment methodology. And again, as I indicated before, um, we have a lot of flexibility. We built a lot of flexibility in this provision. This is uh, 42 CFR 423-888. And <clears throat> the flexibility is that the sponsor can, again, choose the payment frequency, monthly, quarterly, annual, or interim annual. 
And as I indicated before, the difference between interim annual and annual is that for interim annual, at the, right after the end of the plan year, the sponsor will submit the uh, interim payment cost plus the estimated rebate. You can get a, a payment shortly after the end of the year, and then would again have to reconcile those payments within 15 months after the end of the plan year. For annual, you don't bother with the interim payment process. You just submit, essentially submit the, your first request uh, within 15 months after the end of the plan year, and it'll just be in reconciliation format, your final cost and your final rebate amount. Now, once the sponsors select the payment frequency, then they must submit, once the plan year starts, they have to submit the cost data at the same frequency as they selected the payment. So for example, if you selected a monthly payment, you would have to submit at the end of each month the, uh, the interim cost for that month and so forth. Quarterly, you do it quarterly. Annually, do it at the end of the year. So, um, but that's essentially the payment frequency issue. Um, so when you select the payment frequency, just say you select monthly, what, what cost data does the plan sponsor have to submit? And again, uh, I, I say the plan sponsor submits the cost data. Again, if it's a fully insured plan, uh, the sponsor can have the insurance carriers submit the data on their behalf if they elect to do, if they elect to do so. And they would delegate on their application who's going to be submitting the cost data on their behalf. But during the course of the plan year for interim payment, what has to be submitted is the total aggregate gross prescription drug cost for all of its qualifying covered retirees. So that would be one lump sum figure. The total gross cost uh, between cost threshold and cost limit for all of its qualifying covered retirees, plus an estimated rebate amount. Now, um, what is this estimated rebate amount? Well, it would have to be a, an estimate of how much the plan sponsor expects to get from rebates uh, associated with those costs, the gross costs that they're submitting. And it would have to be uh, an estimate based on historical data. So your financial people, your actuaries can take the historical data uh, on what rebate they received in the past and give a, a best guesstimate on uh, what they expect the rebate will be for the upcoming year that's associated with those gross costs that they're reporting for their qualifying covered retirees. Now we recognize that for fully insured plan, really the basis of their cost or, or the premium. And so we devised a special rule for the interim payment period for sponsors of fully insured plan. So in lieu of submitting the gross cost data that incurred under the, the plan by the insurance carrier, they could submit the premium cost uh, as the basis for payment. And then the actuary or whoever would have to allocate, um, would have to break out the premium costs that are associated with those uh, gross costs between the cost limit and the cost, cost threshold and the cost limit and uh, report that amount for, for payment. So you allocate the portion of the premium that's associated with those gross costs. If the premium initially, when it was developed, had factored in rebates, then of course you would not have to provide additional rebate data. 
if the premium does not factor in the rebate, then you would have to provide an estimated rebate amount so that can be subtracted from the premium cost. So essentially, the sponsor of an insured, fully insured plan has a couple of options on how they want to proceed with the interim payment. They could direct their insurance carriers to report the cost incurred under the plan, or they could just re report the relevant premium cost uh, for interim payment. Now for reconciliation, which we'll get into in a little bit, um, the sponsors of the fully insured plan must follow the re regular reconciliation process as the other sponsors do. So the final payment is going to be based on the cost incurred under the plan. And the reason for this is the statute really requires that the payment be based on cost incurred under the plan. So we, we felt we didn't have any flexibility there um, for final payment, although we had the flexibility for the interim payment. Okay, finally, um, what was the policy goal uh, as we started to develop this payment process? And you'll see that they're very similar to the policy goal that I talked about yesterday for the application. Obviously, uh, we had to develop the payment process. We had to comply with the statute and the regulation in that only those allowable costs could be counted toward the subsidy payment. Um, we wanted to keep it s simple and straightforward uh, for the sponsors. This would obviously reduce the frustration, reduce the cost to both the sponsors and the government. And obviously we had to keep it flexible to accommodate both the self-funded and fully insured situation. And obviously we have to make the system secure to handle the proprietary information and also the protected health information of the beneficiary. And last but not least, we have to build the system so that we get enough information to make the accurate and correct payment. Okay, at this point, I'm going to turn it over to Joanne, who's going to give you uh, more details about the process. And then I'll come back in a little while to say a few words about reconciliation. Joanne? Good morning, everyone. Uh, my presentation will cover the interim payment processes and reconciliation processes as we have them defined thus far. Although, as Jim said, the payment processes are still under development and design, and we are looking for your feedback to help us. What I want to start with is to say thank you, of course, to the American Academy of Actuaries for getting us this far. <laughs> feel like I'm won the Oscar awards, but anyway. Um, <laughs> also, um, I need to say thank you to everybody back at work um, who is working so hard and diligently to get the application process up and to define the requirements for what we call release three, which will include the payment process. And also to the focus group participants and those in the audience who've helped guide our thinking. The RDS Center has on its team contractors who are experienced in dealing with reconciliations, providing excellent customer service, as you saw yesterday, and satisfying CMS's alphabet soup office of the day, OIS, OFM, OIG, EPOG, etc. Plus, I've had the benefit of viewing yesterday's session and the Q&A submitted. I've tried to incorporate as many answers as I could into the upcoming payment presentation, but hopefully you'll not be disappointed that I do not have the actual screens to walk through. As I said, I'm hoping to get your input as this session continues and in the weeks beyond. Jim already explained what a qualifying covered retiree is, um, but I'm going to just go over it one more time because from our perspective, there's one more piece to being a qualified covered retiree and that is having the positive response back in our response file that the person is covered through a subsidy period for a month that you're reporting on. 
There was a question, if a person becomes eligible mid-month, can you report costs for that beneficiary or retiree in the month? Yes, you can. First, all costs are applied toward the threshold and then payment request. All payments will be tied to an application, which are tied to a plan year. Next plan year's plan will require another application and payment process. Um, we will be publishing the payment request data, both interim and reconciliation, in the Federal Register for public comment. So you can feel free to hold back today. Just kidding. <laughs> Someone said to show my sense of humor, we all need one, and I've got to say, my nerves definitely have the best of me right now. <clears throat> the requirements are not yet finalized, but the system itself is basically ready. Really, we can create ACH files, accounting reports, and everything. What we don't have yet is the user interface to collect this particular basis of payment. So the purpose of my presentation will be to provide the pictures and explanations of the planned interactions. Again, all payments will be tied to an application, and just like the application process screens that were presented yesterday, you will have you know, drop-down, point-and-click capabilities to review your payment data and remittance advice. Our goal, again, time permitting, is to build a system that allows the most flexibility for the plan sponsor community. And we took the uh, feedback received during focus group sessions and we'll also incorporate the feedback from this session and questions and comments to come later. Each payment request is a claim and must be based on the most accurate information known at the time. Even the interim payments that you receive are a claim to the government and we will give you the opportunity to make corrections to previously reported payment request data. This slide is supposed to present the interactions expected between the RDS Center and the users of the application and payment process. Now, we don't think the users of the RDS programmers are snakes relative to the BOA, so I'm sorry for that acronym, but it really stands for Benefit Option Administrator. As Pat's presentation reflected, we have several user roles planned for the RDS program. The Benefit Option Administrators could be designees, assigned a role for the completion of the application itself, or could just be named in the application as a future contact needed for payment interactions. Either way, this flow is intended to reflect the BOA's kicking off of the interim payment process. The focus group said that some plan sponsors will want nothing to do with the submission of payment request data. They just want to be told when the data is already housed within the RDS system and ready for them to react or finish the interim payment request. Now I said that the system was built except for user interfaces and that includes the fact that we have not yet defined the format for the submission of the payment file. Our plan is also to allow for data entry of the required data within the secure website. Screen designs are not yet ready for public eyes either. They're still on napkins and such. <laughs> but for now, um, let me walk through this flow and the one on the next page. There will be um, sample spreadsheets that I'll go over later on in the presentation that will more um, clearly, hopefully, describe the required data. But for now, let's just assume that we're going to get data from the benefit option administrators or wherever your claims data are housed, because in order to create this interim payment request, you will um, need to have access to claims data in order to get the actual costs incurred so far and to apply the threshold and limit reductions that are applicable. Unless, of course, you're collecting premiums and reporting that way for fully insured plans. And I'll talk about that also with the spreadsheets in a little bit. And that's when the RDS Center first becomes involved. We'll receive the payment files and we'll actually load the data before we'll notify the plan sponsor. So those two boxes really should be flipped. Um, I just 
forgot to flip them. <laughs> um, and so we'll notify the plan sponsor via email um, and the plan sponsor or their payment designee will receive um, an email from the RDS Center and that email will tell them um, that we've received some data. And this is really the first question point that I want to pose to the audience. What we're looking for is to let us know if you think that the notification should include the number of benefit options reporting thus far. So that's to say if you have five benefit options attached to your plan, we received two of five, three of five. Um, the problem here is we understand that not all benefit options may be reporting with the same frequency. So if you've elected a monthly frequency, three of your five may be able to report monthly frequency data, but two may not be quite ready to do that. And so we're not sure that saying three of five is going to be necessarily helpful. Um, but we're happy to incorporate that into our requirements. Um, we'd just like your feedback as to whether you think it will be helpful. Um, and so then the plan sponsor will be viewing the payment summary screen. Um, and as I said, the screens, of course, are not yet de developed. But what you'll be able to see is by benefit option what has been submitted. Um, and you will be able to select which benefit option data you want to include in the payment request. And the reason for this is because you may look at something and know that the numbers just don't quite look right. And because you are making this claim for payment, you are ultimately responsible. And so you need that flexibility to say, no, I'm not willing to take that responsibility to include this amount at this time. You'll notice in the box um, at the right where the BOA submits the data, they can also withdraw data. Um, and so if you did question um, some data's accuracy, the BOAs would have the ability then to withdraw their data and our data files would then be updated to say that we have removed some data and our notification would then include the notification that this benefit option um, data has been removed. And then the process would start again. Our process then will take the selected data and aggregate it together to make an application payment summary total. And this little box talks about um, being net of accounts receivable, and I really want to defer that um, to talk in just a few minutes. Okay, so then this slide continues um, with the next step in this process is once we present the summary screen, which we expect to happen pretty instantaneously, um, the plan sponsor will review and approve the payment request and at this time, we do expect them to be reviewing again the plan, spons plan sponsor agreement um, and attesting to the fact that this data is accurate to the best of their knowledge. Um, questions were asked about the frequency um, elected for payment. During the conference call in June, we said that it was expected that monthly elected payment frequency will cause the RDS Center to receive monthly payment requests within a certain number of days after the end of each month. The frequency example given at the June conference sparked some feedback. So now we're open for your suggestions as to how late that cutoff date should be. Um, the cutoff date suggested, and really it wasn't a suggestion, it was just an example, was 45 days after the end of the month. Um, and there were some pretty strong comments that the data just couldn't be available that quickly. Um, so we're open. Um, again, part of the goal of our whole system design and development is to make it flexible um, to get your participation in this program. Um, it will mean, however, once we set this cutoff point, um, not that you can't request monthly expenditures in subsequent months. So if you were supposed to report January expenditures by May 15th, and for whatever reason you weren't ready, that doesn't mean in June you can't report January expenditures. So relax about you're not going to be losing um, subsidy dollar reimbursements um, with the payment request. It just means that we'll expect less than 12 payment requests from the plan sponsor for this particular application. There was also a question in the Q&A session um, yesterday 
about um, the payment advice, and of course, that yet again is not yet defined, but it will be available electronically as this will be an, a totally paperless environment from the payment perspective. If there are particular data points you would like to see on the payment advice, please let us know. We realize that you need to tie these into your systems as well. And we do understand and are sympathetic that you all have a ton of system work to do as well. And that as soon as we can finalize these payment formats um, will be the better for you all. Um, so we will be leaving this conference and trying to get the public um, comment notice out um, as soon as we can so we can have that 30-day public comment period and more than solidify these payment formats. We are expecting to issue um, payments or run our payment system weekly. Um, just as with the application, the debarment and other bad lists will be checked each time payment is requested. Um, and that's what that little um, diamond is indicating. And so if we have an issue where um, somebody in the application is now showing up on the debarment list that wasn't there um, at the time of approving the application, then the payment, reject, the payment will be rejected um, and there will be an email going out to the plan sponsor, again notifying them that your account is now in a pending status um, and we need to um, clear up this debarment issue. We're also checking to see if the amount itself of the overall payment request is greater than zero or not. Um, and that's because we're allowing you to make corrections to previously reported monthly data. It is possible um, that you will be submitting an overall payment request amount that is less than zero. And in that case, we call that a self-reported overpayment. And, um, we will then issue a demand letter and you will follow the same process, um, be given the same appeal rights um, to question those um, amounts. But of course, if it's self-reported, we sort of doubt that you'll be appealing. Um, what I wanted to quickly talk about also is um, how frequently you can expect to receive your payments once you've um, pushed the submit button. Yesterday, we talked about having service level agreements or SLAs. We have one attached to how um, expediently we um, finalize the payments. Um, and I think it's 30 days from when they were requested. So if um, there was an application where the payment frequency of quarterly is elected for a calendar year based plan, it's expected then that the first payment request will be received sometime after the end of March 2006. Assuming, for example's sake, that the payment request was received on May 15, 2006, a payment could be made by May 16, if the debarment is good and that happens to be the day of the week that we issue payments, but for sure no later than June 14, 2006. Because all payments are being made through EFT, no payment can be effective on banking holidays or weekends, even though every day is a work day for the RDS Center. Did it go? Okay, now this is for what we call the other kind of plan sponsor, those that need to be involved in everything. Um, we needed to be flexible and leave it up to um, the plan sponsor community to manage their account and their payment process as they see fit. The basic difference between this view and the previous one is that the benefit option administrators or their designees will provide the payment data to the plan sponsor who will then decide if the numbers look reasonable before passing the data along to the CMS, to the RDS center. And that's where if the um, plan sponsor does not think that the data looks accurate, they will reject the files back to the benefit option administrators. And that process can be repetitive as many times as um, the benefit option administrators need it to be to get data that the plan sponsor agrees. Uh, same notifications will occur. And this slide does reflect the appropriate load of the data before the notification of the plan sponsor. And it also gives the flexibility to withdraw payment data. Now, at this point, the 
um, plan sponsor has already sort of approved the benefit option data, but it's possible that um, after some time or some thought, and perhaps you know, just sleeping on it for the night, you realize that that data might not be as accurate. So the same withdrawal features will still be there. The data will still be required to be submitted, however, at the benefit option level. We are not expecting the plan sponsors to do the aggregation. We will require the data at the benefit option level to enable us to do appropriate reconciliations at the 15-month um, mark. There's one important note here, and really this applies to all interim payments for um, this transition period. If you have a plan that um, runs, for example, um, 4-1-2005 through 3-31-2006, subsidy payments can be made based on the first three months of actual expenses from 2006. So if you have expenditures in January 2006, February 2006, or March 2006, they can be claimed for subsidy. But the threshold and, however, the limit are applicable to expenditures that occurred from um, April 1st, 2005 through December 2005. So that's why it's important for you to get your retiree lists into us and our responses back and to do that process to keep your retiree eligibility in sync with Medicare Beneficiary Database to enable us to do um, that matching for you so that you can begin to um, isolate those retirees and qualified covered retirees who you will be claiming subsidy dollars for. And this slide, there is no difference from this other plan sponsor way of managing their account than the first one. Um, we will go through the same process to check debarments and to see if there's an overpayment in this payment request or if we can issue an actual payment. So I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time um, on this slide. All right, I do have some takeaways that I'm hoping that you got out of this um, brief part of this presentation. The purpose of the retiree updates is to keep our files in sync and also to keep the Medicare beneficiary database updated to be sure that you're requesting subsidy for only qualified covered retirees. It's going to be important for the plan sponsor to check their account to know when payment data is ready to initiate an interim payment request, to know when payment advice or demand letter is available, and therefore we ask that you pay attention to email notifications received from the RDS Center. The system will be based, will be built with flexibility and ease of use in mind. It will be built upon the application system using the familiar you are here and what's left to do framework and also the help um, on this screen and data element help. The overpayment process will follow, um, this is legalese, HHS overpayment rules 45 CFR part 30. My um, little banner says that I'm an accountant, sounds like I'm a lawyer, but actually I'm neither. <laughs> but anyway, um, this means that the demand letters will be issued as soon as an overpayment is self-reported or reported to the RDS Center based on audit findings, which we'll talk about later in this presentation, or uncovered fraud. The debt is expected to be repaid timely, and interest will be incurred, and debt will need to be referred to Treasury if collections are not repaid timely. EFT, the EFT data agreement part of the application states that the plan sponsor agrees that the RDS Center can deposit or withdraw monies from the named account. We do not plan to withdraw monies to satisfy overpayment amount unless we have issued the proper notification and you have approved and said that this money is available in the account. Additionally, we expect it to be possible for you to agree to a lesser amount of withdrawal than the full overpayment amount. And if 
um, repaying an overpayment would necessitate a hardship at a certain point in time, you, we will um, allow you to um, request installment payments. Um, the payment process, as I said, will be executed weekly. We haven't decided um, which day of the week. Um, maybe we'll just <laughs> pick straws. It probably won't be a Monday or a Friday since we're not giving 100% each day. <laughs> um, requested payments will be processed within 30 days after submission. And um, it does include the creation of the EFT to your bank um, and a payment notice. And we are looking for your help in the design of the payment notice and the required data elements that you're looking for to integrate with your systems. As Jim talked about, the required data for self-insured benefit option is the gross prescription costs paid, the cost, the threshold reduction that has been applied to each qualified covered retiree thus far, the limit reduction, and the estimated cost adjustment for rebates. For each benefit option, we are requesting this data, and the data should be reported for the month in which the costs were paid. Now there is slightly different data required for self-insured versus fully insured interim payments as Jim described. And later on I'll talk about what we expect to capture for um, a fully insured plan. There was a question of can a plan year include more than 12 months? Um, and the question is, answer is yes. Um, there will look like on these screens that we are expecting um, a typical year 12 months, but um, we understand that there are some plans that don't really have an end date, and if that's the case, um, then the application will serve your entire plan year period, however long that happens to be. Um, but there is a separate application required for each plan year and therefore payments will be made for each plan year, however long that year happens to be. The limit reduction, um, just to reiterate, is $5,000 per qualified covered retiree per plan year for applications covering plan years that end in 2006. The threshold reduction is $250 per qualified covered retiree per plan year for applications, again, covering plan years that end in 2006. Now, per the regulation, the cost threshold and cost limit for plan years that end after 2006 will be adjusted in the same manner as the annual Part D deductible and the annual Part D out-of-pocket threshold are adjusted. I certainly cannot answer any questions about what that really means, and so if you do have questions when we break to the q and I'm sure Jim will jump in. <laughs> um, the estimated cost adjustment, um, Jim did say that that was supposed to be based on historical data and also, again, generally accepted accounting principles, and this is the estimate of the extent to which the expected allowable retiree costs will differ from the gross covered retiree plan related prescription cost drugs, this is a mouthful, for expected rebates and other price concessions for the upcoming plan year. This estimate will be used to reduce the periodic payments for the plan year, therefore be apportioned to each month of expenses reported. And this point I really want to make is the reason why um, yesterday it was asked, is there a possibility to change payment frequency elected within an application? And it's because you are apportioning these expected cost adjustments that we didn't feel like it was a good idea to give you that flexibility. Okay, so um, this is a spreadsheet example of the required data for self-insured. There is an assumption that this um, application is expecting a monthly payment frequency. 
there is nothing here. This represents the rolled up benefit option administrator totals. So there is nothing here that says benefit option one is $10,000 of the gross prescription cost and benefit option two is the other 10,000 or five and 15. Um, I didn't wanna present that much detail here, hoping um, that you get the idea. Let me just quickly talk about the purpose of the colors because it does mean something. Um, down the um, column A, we have the month of the plan and this is expecting that this plan is on a calendar year. If your plan was in my previous example running from April through March, then the first month list listed would be April. The months themselves are highlighted in yellow and really um, those are just to indicate the month and there's no data entry required or permitted in any other column. The next line under each month is there are three lines, an old, a new, and a net. Um, and we did get some focus group feedback that helped us solidify the current thinking on this. Um, the old represents what you previously entered, and since this is the first month of reporting, there is nothing in the old. The new represents the dollars that are applicable to this month in the gross prescription costs paid. Estimated premium costs I'll talk about for fully insured plans, the threshold reduction, the limit reduction, and the estimated cost adjustment. The new line is in light blue to indicate those columns where data entry is possible. The column H, the calculated allowable cost, is a calculated field um, and it is based on the um, formula that's presented there where we'll take column C plus column D minus the combination of column E, F, and G. And then finally, the most important column is always the last column, calculated subsidy amount, which is the 28% times whatever the amount happens to be in column H. Now the net will be the difference between what was re previously reported in old and what is currently reported in new. So the RDS center will be calculating the net effect of these changes. But again, because this is the first month, there are no changes and nothing shows up in the net. Now, we move ahead to month four of payment. I didn't think it was necessary to walk through monthly reporting for February and March. Hopefully you'll get the idea. Um, now we're reporting um, April costs but we can also report changes to prior month's reporting. And in this example, we're showing that there was a change to February reported dollars. The reasons for adjustments really could be many. Um, there could be a change to a qualified covered retiree that was used in previous reporting. Um, such that a qualified covered retiree has recently be been added to the benefit plan but was not accepted. You didn't get the subsidy period um, back from our response file pre prior to the previous month's reporting. So you couldn't have included those costs even though they were incurred. Now you can. A person was previously erroneously claimed, not really covered under the plan but for some reason um, was one of those that you entered a delete for um, in the monthly uh, retiree list updates. Or there's a change received for a qualified covered retiree that retroactively impacts the subsidy periods. So we could receive indication that a retiree has signed up for Part D and get that notification out to you um, after you've already claimed expenses for that month or we could get a change from MBD um, that says that this beneficiary um, has, was really incorrectly labeled as eligible um, for or entitled to Part A or Part B. Um, and so for whatever reason, there could be changes relative to dollars that you reported relative to 
qualified covered retirees. There could also have been a change to the actuary calculation of estimated reductions for those chargebacks and rebates. Um, any value that materially affects previously reported cost adjustment data should be reported as soon as it is known. Um, and again, that's because you are making a payment request to the government. This is a claim for money that you will be receiving, even in, though it's on an interim basis and we will be doing the reconciliation at the end of the year. The purpose of reconciliation is really to take into account actual rebate costs that are um, known at the end of the plan year. Throughout the interim payment process, you are estimating, but if there is a change to what you estimated, what your estimate was based on, um, then you need to report that correction as soon as you are aware. Um, the gross prescription cost paid can also change after being reported, and that could be for prescriptions that were subsequently pulled back that were never really picked up, but you incurred a cost. Apparently that happens all the time. Prescriptions that were not included, that were thought not to be part of the Part D benefit, but are subsequently learned to be covered or vice versa. The threshold applicable to the plan year changes or the limit reduction application to the plan year changes, those would be reasons why you would have changes in other areas. And any other previously reported inaccuracies that could be typos or whatever the reason is, um, we want you to be making those corrections as your interim payment process continues. Okay, so for fully insured benefit options, you really have a choice. You can submit using the same method of actual costs incurred as a self-insured plan, or you can base your estimated payments based on premium costs. And as Jim said, if your expected cost adjustments are factored into that premium cost, then you don't have to give us that separately either. But if not, then we would expect that you would give us the estimated cost adjustments that are applicable to your plan as well. Um, the re regulation allows it to be based on a portion of the premium costs paid by the sponsor or the qualifying covered retirees for coverage of the covered retirees under the group health plan. Premium costs, again, using generally accepted actuarial principles, but administrative costs and risk charges must be subtracted from the premium. This is for interim payments only. Reconciliation will require actual costs paid for prescription drug costs incurred by the insurer or retiree. It is possible that the expected cost adjustment may be factored into the estimated premium cost. So here's an example, again, using month one of a plan for fully insured that has opted to use the method two where they're reporting estimated premium costs. You need to use an actuary to define the appropriate per qualified covered retiree premium cost to include in the interim payment request. You should factor in threshold and limit reductions that will be applicable, and you may also factor in estimated cost adjustments. Use only those qualified covered retirees for which you have received eligible subsidy period coverage in the retiree response files. And again, this data is requested by month of expenditures, regardless of your payment frequency election. Now let me just go into that a little bit more since I don't really think I covered that before. If you have elected a quarterly or annual interim payment process, we still are expecting each month of expenditures to be reported. Now for um, moving ahead to month four in a fully insured plan, this looks very similar with the blue and the yellow, the old, new, and net. Um, but again, here we're just reporting differences to the estimated premium cost line uh, column D. And this example also reflects a change in February. The same reasons for adjustment apply here, except 
um, now there could be a change to the actuary calculation of um, the amount of the premium that should be covered. And you should take care to make sure that you, again, do the adjustments as they are um, uncovered. Example three is a combination of an application that has both fully insured and self-insured options within their application. In this example, it's month one, just to keep it simple, where you will be reporting in column C, D, E, F, and G, and we'll do the rest. Again, um, use the eligible retirees, only those retirees where you got an accept um, from RDS using the subsidy periods included in the RDS response file to know if retiree expenses can be claimed for each month. Identify the Part D reimbursable drugs or conversely identify which are not reimbursable under Part D and make sure those costs are excluded from your payment request. This, however, can only be validated during an audit as we will not be getting the actual claim data. Apply the appropriate threshold and limits and remember for this um, time period where part of your benefit year includes costs incurred in 2005, they can and should be applied to the threshold and the limit. So if you have a qualified covered retiree who has exceeded the limit already in costs expended through 2005, you cannot claim subsidy um, in 2006 cost expended for that particular qualified covered retiree. Apply the actuary value to be submitted for the estimated premium cost and estimated reductions for chargebacks and rebates. And again, because of the apportioning of the estimated cost adjustments and premium costs, we didn't think it would be practical to allow a change of payment frequency mid-year. And that actually concludes my part of the presentation on the interim payment process. So I'm going to turn it back over to Jim to let us move into the reconciliation process. Good job. Okay, just a few remarks about the reconciliation process. Okay, now the sponsor had completed the, um, the plan year, had uh, received their interim payments. Now they must go through a, a reconciliation. And this is a, a, a very important process because we want to get to reconcile the interim payment so to get the accurate final payment uh, to the plan sponsor. And this is important for both the government, government and, and the plan sponsor because we want to reduce the potential for overpayment. And the overpayment process is not uh, a fun process to go through. So the better we, job we do with reconciliation, um, the less hassle we'll have with uh, overpayment. Now, the reconciliation process must be initiated by the plan sponsor within 15 months after the end of the plan year. And uh, we um, really went back and forth on the time period because we recognize that um, a lot of rebates are, are not factored or calculated until after the end of the plan year. And so we wanted to allow sufficient time for the sponsor to be able to get the rebate data and rebate calculation. However, we did not want to draw it out too far out into the process, too far out into the next year, or too far down the road um, to hold up the um, determination of the final payment. <clears throat> Now, the process for the reconciliation is enumerated in the regulations. It's 42 CFR 423.88A, B4. 
Um, and again, as I said, it's a process to really uh, capture the actual rebate data and make adjustments for the final payment for the plan year. And uh, we, we think that that's going to be really the unresolved question at the end of the uh, plan years, the, the rebate, because the gross cost uh, really should not change that much from the interim payment to the final payment, although there may be some adjustments, in, such as a qualifying covered retiree passes away, and that wasn't accounted for in the during the year, you would have to make the, the, the adjustment. But the big uh, open question is uh, the rebate amount. <clears throat> so what does the sponsor have to submit for the reconciliation? Again, this is total gross prescription drug costs uh, between the cost threshold and the cost limit for each qualifying covered retiree. And again, this is different from the interim payment cost data because this time it's going to be broken down to the individual retiree level. Now, this is not claims data, but this is total cost for each qualifying covered retiree. And this obviously raises the issue with protected health information because this is down to the individual retiree level. This is protected health information. And so if the sponsor is not set up to handle protected health information, uh, they will not be able to really see this data. Um, it may have to go directly from the insurance company to CMS or to the RDS center. And the sponsor would have to make arrangements with the insurance carrier for that to happen. So in addition to the costs broken down to the retiree level, the sponsor has to submit the actual rebate amount that a portion to each qualifying covered retiree. So this is the rebate amount broken down to the retiree level. Now, um, one thing I need to make clear, and when we're talking about rebates, we're only talking about the rebates that are awarded, awarded after the point of sale. Um, we discussed in the preamble to the final rule that rebates awarded at the point of sale um, are already factored into the gross cost, so there's really nothing to worry about there. We're just really concerned about rebates after the point of sale. <clears throat> now, um, the sponsor would not have to submit the actual rebate data um, to, to the RDS Center uh, for reconciliation. They would just have to maintain that data along with the other required maintained data, such as the actuarial work papers and the claim data for a potential audit. So for reconciliation, the actuary, I mean, the uh, plan sponsor is going to provide the rebate amount that's the portion down to the individual retiree. And we, we think that the actuaries out there would be able to do that calculation. It should be a um, fairly straightforward process to calculate, take the actual rebate data, um, uh, uh, allocate the data to the Part D drugs, and then down to the Part D drugs of the qualifying covered retirees, and then down to the individual retiree level. <clears throat> and that's going to be a, an actuarial calculation that, will, again, won't have to be reported to the RDS Center, but would have to be maintained in the work papers uh, for audit. Now, when we, um, as I indicated, uh, in my earlier presentation this morning, um, this whole payment process and the reconciliation process will have to go through a Paperwork Reduction Act clearance and be subject to a 30-day public comment period. Well, what we're hoping is part of that package, we will provide some guidance on some issues 
surrounding rebates, such as um, what rebates need to be captured, um, how they need to be captured, uh, how they need to be reported. So we'll be uh, issuing guidance on, on those issues uh, down the road. And so any comments or any insight you might have in this area would be uh, greatly appreciated. I think that's all I have to uh, report on the rebates. I'll just turn it back to Joanne, who will just give you a, a brief uh, description of the what expected uh, process flow for uh, reconciliation. Thank you. almost over, <laughs> for me anyway. Um, this looks very familiar to what we just saw for the interim payment process, um, the very first set of screens that were presented, and the reason is because we expect it to be just like that. Um, however, um, even though we're expecting to get data from the benefit option administrators or wherever your claim data is housed, um, we will expect the plan sponsor to initiate the reconciliation. Um, and in this initiation, they will also be providing an assurance that the retiree list is current. They will again be reviewing the plan sponsor agreement and they will have the opportunity to review previous payment history since now 15 months could have passed since the last payment was received for this application. Um, it seems money that was received that long ago surely has been spent by now. Um, there will be warnings if um, the time frame is approaching but the plan sponsor has not yet initiated um, a reconciliation. And the reason that we'll do that is because if we don't receive the timely reconciliation data, then all previous interim payments will be treated as an overpayment. They need to be substantiated by the actual reconciliation data. Oh, I guess I don't need to do that yet. Um, I said that the data must originate from the claim source, and I know that even some plan sponsors have actual claim data, and some do not want to see the actual claim data for their re particular retirees. Um, you can have that data aggregated up to a retiree level um, and opt to look at that or opt to only look at the actual um, gross cost incurred, but somebody needs to be able to um, verify that this data is accurate. Even again for fully insured plans, reconciliation data is based on actual costs incurred, no longer on premium dollars. And just like the interim payments, the file formats are not yet defined. But there will not be an option to key enter this reconciliation data. Um, and the reason for that is because um, now we'll be at retiree level. And so we don't want to take the opportunity to cause potential key entry errors at this particular juncture in this important process. Submission methods will include the mainframe to mainframe and HTTPS file transfer methods we talked about yesterday for the um, retiree file submissions. And so since reconciliation obviously occurs after application, all that connectivity should be in place. We expect the file format to contain the minimal retiree identifying information um, in addition to the cost data for each retiree to allow us to permit matching back to the retiree list subsidy period data. Um, and that, the reason for that is because we will be giving each retiree an identifier number within our system, but we're not passing that number back to you, so you don't have to make those kinds of changes in your systems to um, maintain that number. Um, so we'll still need the information about the name and the social security number or HIC um, number that was provided, date of birth, gender, and those fields to enable us to match back to the retiree list. 
And we are expecting to go through some um, edit process again where we'll be checking to see if the appropriate threshold and limits were applied to each retiree. Um, so we may have more reason codes added back to that response file um, that Pat was talking about yesterday once the um, payment process is implemented. But um, we're again looking for your feedback into how best to give you that information back. Here we are expecting to be able to give you the number of files out of number of files expected since it is expected that each benefit option attached to the application will have at least one qualifying covered retiree attached to the benefit option. Um, I can walk through the flow. We'll be expecting data to be submitted from the benefit option administrators or wherever your claim data is. It will go directly into the RDS center where we will receive the files, do the edit and load. Um, you will also have the same flexibility to withdraw data that previously was submitted um, where you uncovered some errors or possibly were notified of some error conditions. You can remove files and resend until we get it right. And we will be notifying the plan sponsor as data is received um, and loaded or removed. The plan sponsor will be able to view the summary data um, at the retiree level or um, at the overall application effect and decide by benefit option um, that they are ready to sign off on this payment request. Then we'll go through the same process again where we're checking the debarment list, looking to see if the overall amount is greater than zero, less than zero. Well, now we'll be comparing um, the total dollars required under this application to the total dollars previously provided. So if you are on an annual payment process where you have not received any interim payments, this will of course be um, a payment request where an EFT transaction will be sent for 28% um, of the amount received. For all other applications where an interim payment has been received, we'll be comparing the dollars that are due under this application to the dollars previously received. And that result could generate um, a demand or another payment to you. The final result of the reconciliation calculation will be available, um, including the additional payment um, and advice or demand letter within 30 days after receipt of all required data. And basically, that's it for the reconciliation process. It doesn't sound so bad right now, and we really don't have to worry about it. <laughs> And we really don't have to worry about it. Um, the first thing first is get your applications in, get the retiree list in, um, and begin to work with us on the connectivity issues. And so now I think we're moving into the open floor um, question and answer, no? What's next? Oh, well then I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Joanne and Jim. Um, no, we're not going to move right into the, the live. We're going to take a break. But before you all get up and run, the cell phone patrol. <laughs> Yesterday it was wireless. Today it's cell phones. The cell phone patrol is asking again, please check your phones to see that they are on silent. Um, enough said. After the break, oh, also, we do not have any more copies left of the presentations. They will be available on the website in two weeks. Would I please say something again about what's going to happen from 12 to 12.45? Yes. 12 to 12.45, Sapphire Room. Anybody who wants to go in there and network, go in there and network. Now, after the break, we will have the first of three live panels. The first panel will be a panel that will come up 
and address any questions that you have as a result of the RDS payment overview. Now, if you have submitted written questions, do not worry. There will be four live microphones, one in each of the interior aisles. What we will ask you to do is form a line, take one question per person, not more than 15 multiple parts, <laughs> and we will take one question per person so that we can facilitate as many of your questions as possible. If you want to rotate back to the end of the line, that's fine. But we will start and we will take one question at a time per microphone and then come back to the original microphone. And we have uh, until 11 o'clock to uh, take all of those questions. Any remaining questions for the RDS payment overview will then be turned over to the panel this afternoon. Again, that panel process at the end of the day will be similar to yesterday, where people will have taken the, um, the questions and sorted them. Then we will do the next presentation. We will then bring up another panel for that presentation. And that is how we will go through the presentations for today and then conclude the day with the written questions. So if you have submitted a written question and you want to get up to one of the floor microphones, please feel free to do that. It is optional as to whether or not you give your name and address. For those of you that will be up here on the panel, we have requested that they try to bring the lights down as much as they can, even though they're videotaping, so that you can see the people out there. That, that may not be as easy as that sounds. So having said that, we will take a break until 10.15. Thank you. supposed to be. I put you right down there, unless you want to be right here. How close do you want? Which, where? Oh. <laughs> I moved too. Now I wanted to make a clarifying point before we get to Okay, let yeah. me, let me do the introductions and then. I don't know. Oh, thank you. I, 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 I was told yes. I, I don't know. Pat Ambrose, if you're in the audience, we would like you to come up to the panel. If you see her, she's, there she comes. Here she comes. OK, while Pat's making her way up, I have three announcements. The question was asked, if I'm not checking out until tomorrow, do I have access to the Veranda Club? Thursday? The answer is yes. <laughs> I'm not going there. Never mind. Just a reminder to please turn your cell phones to silent. Um, no, we are not paying for lunch today. Um, no, we're not paying for drinks in the bar tonight unless they're going to me. And I don't drink, but white chocolate does wonders. Um, I have been asked by the floor monitors uh, who have received several comments about sidebar conversations. Um, we do have people in here that do have some um, um, problems hearing uh, when the volume gets, you know, as it does sometimes. So if you're having a sidebar conversation, um, please be aware of those around you, both front, back, and inside, on the sides. No, I don't have lottery tickets. 
Okay. The updated slides, one per page in PDF format, including corrections, will be available on the web, RDS website no later than Wednesday, July the 20th. You will receive an email when the slides are available next week. The audio and video recording of the RDS conference will be available in two to three weeks. You will receive an email. At the same time as the uh, recording is available, they are making every effort to provide you with the HTML screen snapshots. The goal is to have that ready at the same time as the video. Uh, for those of you that wanted to retrieve the written questions that you submitted this morning so that you could ask them from the live mics, what's going to happen is we do have a couple of recorders in the back of the room that will be verifying questions uh, so that we, this afternoon, pull those out that have been asked this morning. As we go to this live session, we will focus only on questions that relate to the RDS payment overview. We will ask you to come to one of the live floor mics. We will take them one question at a time, one per person. We will ask that if you want to state your name and your organization, that is optional. If you want to direct it to a specific person, that's fine. Otherwise, we will leave it to the informal decision making up on the podium as to who is going to be um, answering the question. Those that will be participating in this Q&A include, to my immediate right, James Mayhew, to his right, Joanne Sosnak, to her right, David Gardner, and to his right, um, Mark Hamelberg. To my immediate left is Ken Cole, to his left is Pat Ambrose, and to her left is David Manis. Did I get it all right? Who did I miss? You moved. Yes. Sorry. Where's that hard hat? Where's the wizard hat when you need it? See what they do? Yeah. Okay. So, but before we start with the questions, Jim has a clarification that he would like to make. Yeah, I just wanted to clarify a point that uh, we made in the payment uh, presentation. Um, a plan year for which a sponsor is getting a subsidy payment can't be any longer than 12 months. So a plan year can't be any longer than 12 months. Now, I think what we meant to say was that uh, certainly a, a particular qualifying covered retiree can be enrolled in a plan longer than 12 months, but for payment for that particular plan year, uh, it cannot be any longer, for, for a period any longer than 12 months. Thank you. We've got the house lights, all the mics are on, so I think we are ready to begin. Oh, no, one other thing. There, we have run out of this color Q&A sheets. There are now white ones roaming around. It doesn't make any difference what color they are, but now we've had to go to these because we've run out of the other ones. So if you wonder why they're passing those out to you. We will ask that you, again, you have the option of your name, your organization, Please speak directly into the mic so that our signers who are getting electro, uh, audio feed can hear you. We will not be repeating the question um, other than the initial time. I will start with the lady to my far right. I'm Sabrina Gibson with Aon Consulting. And I thought I heard you say that even if you're submitting annually, you still have to provide the data monthly. And if that's true, what was the rationale behind that? That seems to be an increase in the administrative pieces of the reporting. The only monthly requirement is the update file about the retirees. If you choose an annual payment option, when you do finally come to make your payment request at the RDS Center website, what we meant to say was you would, only, you would have to break out those costs for qualifying covered retirees by month. You still only have to come in at one time. Uh, well, if you choose interim annual, you'd actually be making two payment requests, the, the summary interim payment request at the end of your plan year, and then the final reconciliation payment request when you reconcile. But for the interim payment, uh, interim annual, uh, you would have to come into the system 
and break the costs out by month, you wouldn't have to make 12 updates throughout the course of the year to get paid on an annual basis. But my question is, if you're doing an annual filing, what's the point in making us break the data out by month? Because that's just administrative complexity added to the process. Are you talking about interim annual or, or the regular final annual option with reconciliation? Either way. Well, they are two distinctly different processes. If you choose uh, just to submit annual, which is the reconciliation process, um, then you would have to break out uh, you submit the final reconciliation file with drug costs uh, summarized to the beneficiary level, and that would constitute your payment request. We would, we would aggregate that information. We would accept it from whomever your benefit option administrators are submitting the data. We'd present an aggregated uh, final payment request based on the reconciliation data files, and the plan sponsor would simply submit that. The data files would be broken out uh, with the detail but the actual payment request as it's presented to us or to you in the, in the uh, secure website we're envisioning is going to be at, at the summary level. Okay, so you don't have to file those spreadsheet reports if you do just the final payment without the interim. The spreadsheets were provided to give you an example of how we are expecting the files to be broken out. Again, we're, we're, we're not allowing um, data entry on the website. We're not envisioning that. Is that correct? No. Well, not for the reconciliation data, but for interim data, they, right. they can key enter. Right. That's why the distinction is so important if you're talking interim annual or the final reconciliation annual payment process. Dave, I actually have sort of a question for you. I know it's not my turn, but I <laughs> thought that Can we somebody were turn off her mic? <laughs> Well, I, I thought that we, even though they might submit one payment request, that the costs were split out by month um, because then upon reconciliation, we are comparing um, the cost to the number of retirees that they have qualifying covered retirees month by month um, for the subsidy. And, I, you know, I, I'm, I think I, that was one of the, the thoughts behind it, so I'm not sure. Right, if, I'm, I'm agreeing with that. I'm not, okay. If I said something that was okay. not in line with that, I, I apologize. I didn't intend to. The question from the lady at my immediate right, please. Diane Biko from Ford, and I have a question about the reconciliation file. Um, on the file that contains the aggregated drug costs by retiree, allowable costs, must the data element of benefit option identifier be included? We understand its inclusion on the eligibility file, but on the claims files, would you envision that element also be included? Yes, I would. Straightforward enough answer. Thank you. <laughs> the gentleman to my immediate left, please. I'm uh, Christian Ulmer with Desert Mutual. Uh, you, you said that the final reconciliation in essence, the extra 15 months after the end of the year only applies to rebates, to, to get actual rebates. I'm concerned about IBNR and runoff. If, an, if a beneficiary incurs a claim in December of 2006, I'm assuming a calendar year plan, um, say, it's, uh, say it brings them from $400 to $450, so they're, you know, it's above the threshold. But it's paid in January of 2007. Where does that go? Does it go on the reconciliation for 2006? Does it go on the January, uh, you know, does it go into the January plan year, the, you know, the 2007 plan year? Or is it lost? <laughs> I would think that it would go with the reconciliation because it was incurred during the calendar year and it was actually paid. But you know, the fact that it wasn't paid till after the calendar year, uh, as long as you're still within the cost limit, um, that can be reported on reconciliation. Meanwhile, it wouldn't go in on any interim report, certainly not the January interim for 2007? I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. Well, it, it, it's my understanding that you can adjust interim uh, payment requests up until reconciliation. Correct. Um, it's just that you were explaining most of these payments being on the month paid rather than month incurred. Exactly. Um, 
say the, the question is, um, if it was incurred in the last month of the plan year and actually paid in the next month of the new plan year, which application does it go with? The later plan year. That's what I thought. Okay, what if you decide to drop the dub, drug seven for 2007? Uh, the yes. date, let me clarify. <laughs> The, the, um, the date at which you need to be concerned with querying your claims databases is the date that the, that the plan paid the claim. So in the pharmacy network, a lot of this happens real time. Of course. Okay, so it, it should be fairly simple. But we do realize that there are going to be, there are potential delays in, in filing of claims. So um, I, I missed the first part of your example. I apologize. So if, if you were assuming that it was a calendar year, and you had uh, an individual um, go on their own to the pharmacy and get a prescription paid. Things uh, or they, they went out of pocket and paid it themselves and then subsequently submitted a claim to, the, uh, to whomever the, the payer should have been. Um, and that, that paid date that could happen in February, March of the following year uh, cannot be included. Uh, in the reconciliation file. Obviously, you wouldn't have a paid amount. Uh, actually, the paid amount wouldn't have occurred or wouldn't relate to the application period, the plan year included in your application. And I think your example was for 2006. Right. So does that answer the question? Or it, do I need it to? It does. You're in essence saying that would not be reimbursable. For, well, for that year. For that year. If you have submitted an application and go through the process for the next year, for the plan year ending in 2007, December 31, 2007, you could include that in that year. Okay, the next question then no, is... No, sir, we're going, if you would not... No, this is, no, is a follow-up to that. If I, if I can, so that others can um, also have a chance to ask questions, we're going to have a little confab after this, and we'll make sure to address <laughs> it later, if that's okay. Okay, I, I, I don't. I, I know this is obviously a critically important issue, but I want to make sure that everybody gets a chance to ask. And and, and it is important. I want to make sure that uh, nobody gets the the wrong impression. That's okay. And if you have follow-on <coughs> questions to your questions, please write them down so that we do have record of them. The lady to my far left, please. Okay, I'm Donna Marshall from Washington State Healthcare Authority. My question is, if a plan sponsor who has multiple benefit options chooses to have each one of the benefit option administrators submit the subsidy payment requests on their behalf, does the plan sponsor need to submit an application for each one of those benefit options, or can they submit an applica a combined application that just identifies each one of the options? The benefit options are identified in the application. And the assigning of roles for who can be involved with the payment process also happens in the application as designees uh, are added and authorities are given to those designees. So there's no need to uh, assign folks at a, at a later date or to submit a, another application. Uh, all, all individuals you want involved with, from start to finish for that benefit year, with you know, submitting the application, submitting payment requests, appeals, doing anything involving information associated with that benefit year in that application. You need to designate them in your application. And we're allowing, uh, we're allowing you to continue to update who those individuals may be throughout the course of the benefit year through the website. So those, we realize that those individuals can change, so we're allowing you to do that. Um, could you repeat the second half of your question? I want to make sure we address it. I was just making sure, do they need to submit a separate application for each one of the benefit option plans? No. Okay, they can do it and, in mind. Right, and I think you had another piece to your question, maybe it was the first part, but you were, you, were, you, you well, let me clarify, you, you had said, do, do, do individuals or do those benefit option administrators have to submit uh, payment requests on your behalf? Let me just clarify, what, what needs to happen is the data files, um, the drug, the, the, the files that you saw, the spreadsheets, the spreadsheet examples of, I realize they weren't screenshots, but um, those are essentially going to be file formats that a benefit option administrator would submit to us at the RDS Center. We would aggregate those for the purpose of the plan sponsor making the payment request. 
not the benefit option administrator. The plan sponsor, per the regulation, has to be the one submitting the payment request. So we will collect data from the benefit option administrators, um, aggregate, arrange that data into a format that's user friendly on the website. The plan sponsor then will need to come in and actually submit, review and submit that payment request. Okay, thank you. The lady to my far right, please. I'm Jill Mishker from Restat, and my question is for James Mayhew. Uh, during the payment overview, you defined who a qualifying covered retiree was. Could you please repeat that? You want me to repeat the definition of qualifying covered retiree? Yes. Okay. Uh, a qualifying covered retiree is someone who is a part, a Medicare eligible individual who is eligible to be enrolled in Part D, but is not enrolled in Part D, and is in a, not in what we call current employment status. So most, most likely they're either retired or disabled. And they're obviously in the um, sponsored prescription drug, drug plan. And the spouse? And, and that also include, uh, can include the spouses and dependents of the participants, as long as they are Medicare eligible and um, qualify for Part D but don't enroll in Part D. Does that help? I thought you had stated that if the spouse was employed. Right, okay, I'll, 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 let me just give that scenario one more time because I know it, it's fairly complicated. Let's say you have um, a participant in employer A who is Medicare eligible, eligible to be enrolled in Part D but does not enroll in Part D and is retired. Okay, employer A can collect the subsidy for that, for that person. Say that participant has a spouse who is also on employer A's plan. This spouse is Medicare eligible and is not enrolled in Part D. Even if the spouse is actively working for another employer but is not covered under that employer's plan, is covered, still covered on the employer A retiree plan, then employer A can collect the subsidy for that, for that spouse, even though that spouse is working for another employer. Because that spouse is covered on the retiree plan based on the participant's retiree status. Conversely, if, if you have employer A covering a Medicare eligible individual uh, who does not enroll in Part D, but that individual is working and is on the active employer, employer A's active plan. Obviously, because that is an active employee, employer A cannot collect the subsidy for that person, nor would they be able to collect the subsidy for the spouse, even though the spouse is retired and Medicare eligible because the spouse, again, is getting covered through employer A because of the active status of the participant. Thank you. Thank you. The gentleman to my right, please. Derek Eiton, Mercer Consulting. If I understand correctly from this morning when Ms. Sosnock was talking about the claim submission, that they would, the data would have to be separated by benefit option. If you have a plan where you are combining all your groups for one net test, and let's just say you have one PBM, what would be the purpose of having to separate all that claim data by benefit option? Uh, I personally can't answer that. I thought that the purpose of the application gave you the ability to designate uh, options, benefit options within the plan as they are related to satisfying the gross and the net test. Um, somebody else can jump in. <laughs> yeah, I, I think we might be mixing just a couple of, of issues here that may, that may be a little confusing, but in order for us to know 
how to reconcile uh, the payments we've made throughout the course of the year. Uh, we believe at this time that we need to know um, which benef unique benefit option a retiree was uh, enrolled in at various points in the year. And since a retiree can change options in, in some cases, maybe not in your case, but in some cases it's possible given life changes or whatever that uh, a retiree can choose a different option during the middle of your benefit year that would actually be an option included under the plan in this application. Um, if that were to occur, in order to get the accurate information, we would have to get it from both sources, both, both benefit option administrators, if they are in fact two different um, entities. And actually, whether, they're not, whether or not they're two different entities is almost irrelevant. It's whether or not it's two different options you've identified to us under the application. So for tracking purposes and knowing and marrying that cost data back to when this retiree uh, was actually enrolled, which months they were enrolled in which particular benefit option, it becomes important at reconciliation time. Yeah, I mean, I, I would just urge you to reconsider that because as long as you have one retiree list, which we have to submit one list, and it tells you what months people are covered, it doesn't seem to me to matter how the claim data gets divided up because you're going to get to the same answer uh, at the end of the process. And I would encourage you to submit that comment when we, when we go out for comment, public comment on the uh, payment request information. If I could just uh, emphasize the point that Dave just made. Um, obviously, the, as, as I spoke about at the very beginning, and, and I think many of you have appreciated, the time frames imposed on CMS to get all this up and running are, are beyond tight. So obviously, as anybody uh, w would expect, the rational thing to do is to triage the most critically important things based upon when they needed to be done. So the payment uh, processes are really the last piece of the puzzle, since the payments are, in fact, aren't going to be made till at the earliest, early 06, uh, while the applications are going to go live starting August 1. So that while we're obviously very far down the road in thinking things through, perhaps some of the discussion I, up here may ref reflect the fact that we haven't put everything entirely to bed, which can be good news for you folks, because we are giving you the chance to comment and to influence how the final uh, process is going to work on the payment side. So um, I, I do encourage people uh, for those sorts of comments to make sure they get them in once the, we make that available, which will be very soon. Yeah, and just to add to that, we, we debated whether or not we wanted to go into this level, uh, give you exactly sort of what our latest thinking was, because we knew uh, that it could be changing slightly as we move forward to, through this, uh, uh, this PRA notice, Paperwork Reduction Act notice. But we, we thought it was only fair to give you um, our latest thinking, and, and also it, it, just to help you plan and also for us to get your feedback. So that's why this is going on, and you know, just have to forgive us if we don't have the answer to every single question you asked today. The lady to my left, please. Uh, good morning. Uh, Kim Hickman with Mercer Human Resources. We Consulting. can hardly hear you. Step up the mic. Thank you. Uh, Kim Hickman with Mercer Human Resource Consulting, uh, which turns out to be a follow-up to Derek's question. Um, with regard to the initial uh, submission, the monthly, quarterly, interim, annual submissions of data, um, you had I'm wondering, is that information only going to be entered in a keyed fashion, or is there going to be some HTTPS upload capabilities, main to main, et cetera? The interim uh, payments will be accepted in a key entry fashion, as well as file transfer using mainframe to mainframe and the HTTPS, same as um, reconciliation and the retiree list. Great, thank you. You're welcome. The lady to my far left, please. Uh, Michelle Tooker, Mayo Clinic Foundation. Could you bring your mic up just a little, please? Um, my question um, relates to the end of the year reconciliation process and rebates. Um, you use a lot of words like aggregate and allocate these rebates, but when I read the regulations, it leads me to believe that you need more detailed level allocation of those rebates. And 
The example I would like you to address is, let's say I take Tylenol and you take Aleve. We're both in the plan. Tylenol gives rebates and Aleve doesn't. So when we allocate these rebates, does the Tylenol rebate get allocated to all the participants or only the participants that received a prescription for Tylenol? So what level do you need this detail at? Um, no, we'll, um, we're really counting on the actuaries to be able to uh, use uh, so if act, I have well, an actual, I mean, I mean, it's an honest answer because uh, it's a very complicated area, and you know we're counting on the actuaries to be able to really do even generally accepted actuarial principle to be able to allocate the rebates down to the individual level, and you know they're going to have to look at the basically the volume of the utilization of each particular group and determine probably either you know, like a weighted average to allocate that rebate cost that, that's worthy at the drug level and be able to filter it down to the retiree level. So you would accept an actuarially sound method? Yes. Uh, I mean, it's, it's not required by mm -hmm by the regulation to have an actuary do the calculations, but it's our anticipation that the actuary probably would, or it, it could be an accountant or a financial person, okay. but it, um, it would have to be using a generally accepted accounting principle and actuarial principle to do the allocation. Okay, thank you. And again, if I could supplement that, it is something that uh, we have had several recent questions about rebates. So it is something we might consider issuing further guidance on, perhaps not for this year, perhaps for future years. But we'll obviously keep everyone posted. Good, thank you. The gentleman to my far right, please. Uh, good morning, Tom Parsiak with AI. Sir, we can't hear you. I'm um, sorry. Tom Parsiak with AI Consulting. And as a health actuary, I'd welcome further guidance on that issue. But my question is. <laughs> Are you sure? <laughs> I don't want to go there. Um, my question is regarding the term benefit option, which we've heard a lot of uh, yesterday and today. And I'd like, if possible, to get some clarity on how discreet that term can get. Uh, I'm concerned about a situation, for example, you have a common plan design in terms of co-pays or deductibles, et cetera, that cross several groups, where one group may have their contributions, their premium for this option be a percent of pension. Another group may have their contribution be a function of years of service. Would I have a situation where each discrete contribution dollar amount defines a benefit option, or does the formula define a benefit option? I think the sponsor has a really, as long as the options are within the a single plan, the sponsor has the discretion to, to define uh, what is the benefit option uh, within their plan. Uh, they can use uh, a, a characteristic such as a formula or a cost sharing arrangement to define that option. I mean, it can't be an arbitrary arrangement, but it can be uh, an arrangement based on a characteristic uh, of a particular um, group or whatever to define that as an option. Thank you. Thank you. The gentleman to my right, please. Hi, I'm James D. Benedetti from CalPERS. And my question is that given that your RDS payments are based on actual costs, um, how do you plan to pay employers with just a few Medicare retirees, for example, maybe as few as one, without violating HIPAA restrictions on protected health information? Sorry, I, I didn't hear all your questions. Could, could you read? Could you repeat the question? the question, please? Yeah, if you have just, um, say, one, two, three or so Medicare retirees in your um, Medicare plan and you get a retiree drug subsidy, um, how do you avoid violating HIPAA when you pay the employer that amount? Okay. Um, 
Well, that, that's an excellent question. Um, but well, first of all, so uh, I guess to really answer your question is, do you think that the subsidy amount would reveal to the employer the drug utilization of, of the individual retirees? Well, the, the payment will be uh, an overall lump sum amount. The payment would not necessarily be broken down to the individual retirees. It could be based on individual retirees, but the actual payment itself uh, could be um, a lump sum. But if you only have, say, one retiree, then that is broken out at the individual level. Right, right. Um, is this a yeah. likely scenario? I don't know if there's a way around that. In our system, we I have understand. 95 employers with one Medicare retiree. So we're trying to get an example how you guys are going to handle the situation to possibly guide us. Well, operationally, I can tell you what our latest thinking is. It's not final, but our latest thinking. Again, we talked about the application and how you uh, designate uh, various individuals with certain authorities to view different types of information uh, within, our, within our system. Uh, you can have, uh, a, it is conceivable in our system to have a plan sponsor with an authorized representative and account manager and designees that do not have the authority to see retiree specific information. And that is something that you can indicate to us on the application. And we're considering when we present payment screens uh, at the time that you're submitting payment requests, that a plan sponsor would be submitting a payment request to show only aggregated information. That said, your larger scope question about HIPAA and you know, revealing uh, information about a specific individual um, is a good one. And I'm not sure what the answer is right now, because in the exact example you gave where there was only one, I mean, I really am not sure that, that it will be possible. So uh, well, we'll me, have to take that under advisement. Let me just ask, let me ask a question or two. In those cases, do your employers <coughs> generally have procedures in place to protect data or, or, or not? Do they there are so few people in that organization quite often. You know, we have mosquito abatement districts and just yep. small groups, boards, commissions that contract with us. Right. I mean, uh, we, we can go and talk to the Office of Civil Rights, which is the uh, entity within uh, the Department of Health and Human Services, and perhaps issue some guidance on this. We have been on talking with them recently and, and gotten further uh, comfort and clarification about uh, how the, and there's information in the preamble to the regulations, and in fact, in the regulations itself, that generally says that uh, the uh, activities that an employer may engage in relating to the subsidy program are consistent with the HIPAA rules. So I understand exactly what you're saying, that an employer that may not otherwise have procedures in place to protect individualized data may be able to uh, work backwards and figure out generally what a given person's claims costs might be. Although, you know, and if it's an insured arrangement, you know, there, there are a lot of steps. It's a pretty inferential situation. If it's self-funded, then clearly you're going to know what it's going to be because you're paying the cost. If it's insured, then you might be able to do this sort of inferential situation, and, and it could be PHI. Uh, my, we can talk with them to see if there's a need to issue further guidance. Obviously, you can handle this by amending your plan to tell people that you would protect that data. That may not be the most ideal response, although the protections that would be required are pretty minimal in that case. Uh, and others may have a different view, but we'll, we'll follow up on that. I, I think as a general matter, I don't see that as a critical problem. Okay. Thanks. The gentleman to my left, please. Tony Cuscio, Emerson Electric. I assume the uh, term rebate includes all the streams of revenue that come from uh, pharma drug manufacturer and these transparent contracts that PBMs now have with employer groups or coalitions. They get back educational revenue. They get back uh, the revenue that uh, pharma get, or that, that the PBM gets for selling uh, data to pharma. But what about class action lawsuits? On July 15th, uh, the deadline for filing class or being part of a class action to recover money from the manufacturers of Hytrin or Tetrazosin, uh, 
where the drug manufacturer either was engaged in price fixing or restraint of trade. Those monies may not come back for a number of years. I suspect most of that money will go to the trial lawyer uh, who filed the uh, lawsuit. <laughs> But how do we account for that money, and is, that in, is it intended that we account for that if we get back $10,000 or $20,000 on, on, uh, as a result of our filing as part of the lawsuit? Well, the good news is that lawyer fees are not considered rebates. <laughs> uh, um, but, um, you know, that, that's an unusual situation, and obviously... Um, no, it's not so unusual. There are five of these well, in the last year. Well, I mean, it, it, it's not... Uh, I, I hear you. Um, as I said, we might consider issuing some further guidance, and we would welcome your uh, comments on that, but um, uh, we'll, we'll take that under advisement. I, I suspect, you know, part of the problem is, are we going to ask you to do some estimate of the probability of recovery? I mean, it gets... That's almost impossible to estimate. A absolutely. Right. I, I agree. So, and if you get it 10 years down the road, we're not going to be reopening something that happened 10 years ago. So. Yeah, the administrative cost of trying to reopen something may not be worth it to the government to try to recoup those costs. So that'd be an employer windfall, are you telling me? <laughs> no, as you said, it's a, uh, I won't go there. Never mind. Speaking as a lawyer, I had a, yeah, we'll just drop it. Right, the, the, RDS Center does, the RDS Center does have the opportunity to receive a request for reopening from plan sponsors. Um, there are areas of the regulation that do speak to reopenings. So um, from an operations perspective, as long as it may be, Jim, you could talk a little bit more about reopenings and good cause, but the, the RDS Center does have the opportunity to consider reopening um, a, a, a previously reconciled uh, period of time, so. We'll be addressing the reopening and good cause in a next uh, presentation on, on appeal. The lady to my far left, please. Thank you. Abby Wilson, Kaiser Foundation Could you Health come up Plan. Come the mic a little more, please. Abby Wilson, Kaiser Foundation Health Plan. And this is a question for Joanne Sosnock. I was wondering if she could give a few examples of why a plan sponsor would not accept the um, BOA data sent for the payment request. Um, the best example I can think of is if you have reason to believe that, for example, you have five members in this particular benefit option and you get a payment amount requested of $5 million, it's going to look wrong. Um, so I, I, I mean, it's mostly going to be gross errors like that that you'll be able to detect. Um, Beyond that, I mean, I certainly don't expect the plan sponsor to be able to validate these um, data that comes from the benefit option administrator, especially in the instances where you don't have access to the actual claim cost data. Okay, thanks. You're welcome. Ladies and gentlemen, we are out of time for this segment. However, if you are standing at the microphone with a facilitator, Facilitators, would you make sure that if they would like to do this, that they submit directly to you in writing your questions. Those questions will be then given to me, and when we have the final Q&A this afternoon, your questions, since you have been standing so patiently at the microphones, we will put there in uh, as a result of your being very patient. So the facilitators give them directly to those facilitators, facilitators, if you'll give them directly to me. I would like to thank our panel. Let's take a five-minute stretch break while we get ready for the next presenters.